identity and mission revealed in silence. And I think for every guy, we need to hear this, is if you want to know your identity truly, if you want to know your mission truly, if you want God to work through your life truly, you've got to be determined to enter the silence daily because God says, I'm not impressed with holocausts and sacrifices, but an open ear, an open ear. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of The Catholic Gentleman. We are so blessed that you have decided to join us on this, our 150th episode. That's right, you heard me. This is 150. This is the 150th episode. We have been so blessed to bring this to you for three years now, consistently weekly for three years. Actually, this month, I think March 14th was the official launch date three years ago. So so what a blessing it has been. And uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for your prayers and for expanding the reach. Um, We are so blessed that you are here and it keeps us going. Right, Sam? That's absolutely right. Yeah. Um, You know, I, uh, there were a few podcast podcast episodes before John came on board and they were quite terrible. And then John (laughs) came and uh, whipped us into shape and things have been onward and upward ever since then. It's been absolutely amazing to see the audience grow. And I'm just so thankful um, for John's expertise, he really has brought a ton of effort to making this podcast shine. And so thank you, John, for all the many hours you poured into uh, making this podcast the best that it can be. Thank you, Sam. I appreciate that. It's been it's been a love and a been a joy. And so, you know, for all your groundwork to make this possible has been um, a, a deep and meaningful part of my life. So thank you. So today, men, we are going to be talking about the strongest man ever to live. And and who are we? We are your hosts. I'm John Heinen. We've got Sam Guzman and we've got Devin Shaw coming at you every single week. Today, in our live public edition, we're going to be talking about pillars, three pillars that uh, relate to uh, this man. And then when we go inside of our private uh, exclusive edition, we're going to talk about more. We're going to go in more in depth into that. And so if you didn't know this, every single week we come at you with this live public edition. Uh, and then on the inside of Catholic Gentleman Plus, we have a more extended edition where we dialogue about these topics deeper and deeper. Each month inside of Catholic Gentleman Plus, we're also coming out with an exclusive themed uh, course or session for men every single month. This month is St. Joseph, right? We've got March 19th is his feast day this month, and we are talking about St. Joseph. We've got a couple great conversations already live there. Um, Devin is going to be our guest expert. He is the executive director of Fathers of St. Joseph. So this month, we're going to go into St. Joseph. We're still working on some of the details of what we're going to talk about inside there, but it's going to be great, and it's going to be directed just for men. And so you can head over to Catholic Gentleman Plus. It's also a great way to support us. So again, here we are. 150th episode is so great. Please help us reach more men by sharing this episode, by giving us a five-star review if you're listening to us on Spotify or Apple. And uh, that reach goes such a long way. We thank you again for joining us. So to set the stage here, We all have a love for this man. We have all grown in love for this man. And this individual is, drumroll, St. Joseph. We're going to talk about St. Joseph. (laughs) This episode is coming out on uh, Thursday um, and in Tuesday. Next Tuesday on March 19th is going to be the Feast of St. Joseph. So it was really good and fitting for us on our 150th episode to devote it to a man that has guided us and directed us so uh, deeply in our own personal lives. I know that I have brought it up on different episodes before, but I prayed a two and a half year incessant novena to St. Joseph, which brought me to my career path that set dreams in my life that I never knew I had because they were more of God and honestly helped me um, get over a lot of my um, pride, preconceived notions, hurdles, and even sufferings and issues that I had. St. Joseph was my, my guide and my model and my you know, individual that I, I spoke to on a, on a daily, every single day basis for two and a half years. And I still speak to him. And so I'm so grateful for him in my life. Sam, what's your devotion to St. Joseph? How, how has your devotion grown from being a non-Catholic to now being this on fire Catholic that you are? Yeah. Well, I, I think St. Joseph is 
such an amazing figure for so many reasons for for so many different reasons and i think for me initially the biggest hurdle coming into the church was this idea of like devotion to saints in general um and that this wasn't idolatry that, that this wasn't something sinful or like they got in the way of more relationship with christ but was actually something that facilitated that and drew us cro closer to christ because the saints are never in it for themselves. They're always mm -hmm. seeking to bring greater glory to God. Um, and for me, my initially, I'll just be honest, my initial devotion was to the Blessed Mother. Like I felt this immediate attraction to her motherly presence, since that was something completely absent from uh, my Protestant experience was like any kind of devotion to um, mother figure, if you will. It was... Mm -hmm. Um, and so I was immediately, my heart was attracted to the Virgin Mary, but, but as I've grown in my faith and I think, um, it's become more and more clear that, um, our Lord and our lady both want to honor St. Joseph, um, Christ, because that was his earthly father. Um, and that, that is no small role. Like let's, let's just acknowledge yeah. that just as the dignity of the Virgin Mary is due be to her mother, um, her mothership of our Lord or her, uh, maternity of our, our Lord. So is the dignity of St. Joseph due to his, uh, f fatherhood, um, his, his fatherhood to, um, to Jesus. I'm getting my words all tangled up, but, but this idea that St. Joseph had this unique and profound dignity of being the earthly father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we can't underestimate how important that is. And no, he was not the biological father of Jesus, but his fatherhood was just as real. In every other way, he was a total father to our Lord Jesus Christ. He, he took care of him. He taught him. He protected him. He nurtured him, showed him love, helped him grow in that did that wisdom and knowledge that scripture talks about that Jesus grew in, in his humanity, of course, obviously in his divinity, he didn't need to learn anything, but in his humanity, I think he humbled himself and laid aside that divine dignity in order to embrace fully our humanity. Because as our faith teaches, Christ was fully human and fully divine, but that full humanity he had to learn and grow um, in different ways. And St. Joseph was that guide that taught Christ what it meant to be a human male. Um, and Jesus like apprenticed himself, um, both in the workplace, yes, but also just in the degree of like manhood. Show me what it means to be a man, as every young boy does, right? right. Um, and I think St. Joseph was that, that perfect model for our Lord in his humanity, like growing as a man. And he no doubt taught him many things. Um, and that's, that's kind of a divine mystery, right? Like that, that interplay between Christ's divinity and his humanity. But we do know that he was fully human and he did have to learn to read and write. And he had to learn how to handle the saw in the workshop and all of those yeah. things that young boys have to learn. Um, and St. Joseph was that guy. So I think, I guess what I'm getting at is Our Lady loves St. Joseph because she really, he really was her husband. And I think there was this deep affection between the two of them. And, and when you get close to our mother, she says, I want you to get to know my husband. Um, and, and I think there's a, a growing in love for the whole holy family and all that they represent for us. Um, and, and so, yeah, I've just really grown in my love and devotion to St. Joseph <laughs> as a father myself. And he's a model of perfect fatherhood, um, but also uh, in many other dimensions, which we'll get into later in the episode. But seeing him as not only just like an abstract image of fatherhood, but actually as someone who can be an advocate, who can be a friend, who's someone you can actually relate to um, and not just as kind of a, a distant uh you know, image of fatherhood on the horizon that we can imitate in some way, but actually as someone who can be intimately involved in our life and who can intercede for us and who can help us grow spiritually as men. So 
Agreed. A little bit long winded, but that that's mm-hmm. a that's a bit of it. I like it. I liked how you <clears> talked <throat> about Our Lady guiding you to Saint Joseph because mine actually w- ran in kind of a parallel. Uh, that I was consecrated to Our Lady. I was uh, discerning that, reading, you know, Treatise of True Devotion to Mary, reading Maximilian Colby, trying to better understand my relationship with her, going through the consecration. And then I um, got this uh, direction from a spiritual director to pray this incessant novena to St. Joseph. And so I'm, Our Lady was guiding me for certain, you know, but it was a little bit more indirect in my own thought process or in my own uh, knowledge of it. And so it was just kind of like, you know, for me, building up devotions. And then this became a new devotion, you know, that I was that I was gravitating towards. And it wasn't until later that I started working on the dimensions of their relationship and the dimensions of how they been working in my life. So I appreciate that. So Devin, who has founded a um, apostolate called the Fathers of St. Joseph and has written book after book after book. I've got one right here, (laughs) uh, Joseph's Way, um, on St. Joseph. Uh, You know, where did your where did your devotion to 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 Joseph start, uh, Devin? I think that's a great story for us to hear. Sure. I I was well, it was after several calamities. My third daughter was born at 28 weeks premature. She ended up on life support. Uh, I lost my job. I came down with cancer and my life was basically spinning out of control. And then on top of it, I had close to a million dollars worth of hospital bills and about $200 in the bank. And <laughs> and I, I was really at my low point. <laughs> and yeah. and uh, a friend of mine, um, there was a couple of things. My wife said, when she saw our daughter, Anna Marie on life support, she said, I need you to come home and be a husband and father. And at that time, I was working overtime around the clock. We've talked about this before. I was trying to start my own business. I was doing everything and anything, but really being a husband and father, because frankly, I didn't know what that meant. The world's version of being a husband and father is, man, you you work your rump off to make a lot of money and you try to get wealthy and let the kids fend for themselves. You know, you've mm-hmm. got enough money for mom to buy clothes and food and you just kind of do your own thing and the kids will take care of themselves but you quickly realize that that's not the case, especially in our culture, you see the ramifications of that thought process. But long story short, I tried. It was difficult to be a husband and father. I was languishing. I really tried. And then a friend took me to Medjugorje, which I know is very contentious, but there, our tour guide or our pilgrim leader is a female. I was talking to her about this burning desire to do something for the Lord, or at least to do something with my life. Mm. And she said, are you married? And I said, yes, I'm married. And she said, do you have children? Yes, I have three. And she said, then go home and be St. Joseph. Mm. And that that didn't really resonate with me the right way. <laughs> I just started thinking, Joseph, yeah. okay, St. Joseph, like I too did not have any kind of relationship, let alone admiration for the man, you know? And so all I knew of him was stained glass windows where he's lurking in the darkness, kind of bent over a cane, you know, uh, he's bald, he loves lilies. And so I'm just, okay, great, you know? <laughs> okay. He loves lilies. And uh, yeah. so, but I went home and I carved out space in my attic And I made that my little chapel. And then I would begin praying about this and asking Our Lady to introduce me to St. Joseph. And then it was amazing because it was like I was on download. And that book that you just held up was the fruit of those prayer times of download Mm. after download. And what I did, that book is, was a letter to myself to try to capture the vision of fatherhood through St. Joseph. And what, what occurred to me, which was most powerful with St. Joseph was, though there are men who are saints... And though there are fathers who are saints, the church rarely ever canonized a saint because he was a man, a husband, and a father. You know, mm, it was agreed. because he's a priest, a bishop, or a missionary, yeah. um, or a pope, but not because he was a father. And then when I started to see St. Joseph through this lens, I realized that the two greatest saints in the church that the church commends to us to have friendship with were not monastic mother, monastic woman or a celibate, well, they were celibate, but not a monastic man, but it was a husband and father, a a mother and a wife. And that just opened me up to a whole new realm of possibilities that, wait a minute, I, I could too be a saint. 
I could too follow this man's footsteps. And that led me on a journey to say, okay, what are his footsteps? What is the schematic of his life? What are the pillars on which he stood? And I found this great little devotion at the very beginning of this journey where it was Joseph's fidelity, you were to meditate on these four things, Joseph's fidelity to grace, Joseph's fidelity to the Mm -hmm. interior life, Joseph's fidelity to the blessed Virgin Mary and his fidelity to Christ. And it was by meditating on those things daily, three three times a day, actually, boom, the world of St. Joseph was open to me in a way that I'm eternally grateful for. And then literally I became the donkey, the ass that he holds by that tether and I follow him and he allows me to carry Mary and Jesus, you know, and their mysteries to the world. And that's precisely what's happened. So wow. Joseph is an expert at leading asses and I'm among one of them. So I'm very <laughs> thankful. <laughs> oh, I love it. And it is such a great story. And I appreciate you sharing it with us because mm-hmm. hopefully our listeners are seeing if you're down and you're suffering and you're struggling and this is a tough time in life, turn to St. Joseph. He's going to uh, help get you through it. And so I want to talk though, very honestly here, right at the beginning, before we dive into these, you know, uh, call them pillars, of St. Joseph are uh, five pillars that that we've chosen today and how we should live them and why they're important and then talk about St. Joseph is the fact that if you don't know this, uh, at least in the Western church, St. Joseph is given the uh, um, title of protodulia, right? So we've got latria, which is uh, devotion, adoration, worship that is due to God alone. And then we've got hyperdulia, which is that um, uh, um, reverence and, and intercession uh, due to our lady. And then we've got proto Dulia and then all the other saints are, are just Dulia. And so he poor has saints. been given this, mm-hmm. yeah, these, these, all these poor saints there in the beatific <laughs> vision and, um, and you know, uh, nothing but joy. Um, and, um, and so he has that title. He has that, uh, I guess, honorary tier or that honorary, um, um, uh, level that we, uh, should look up to and we should pay attention to, even if you realize that he was only spoken of in two of the four gospels. He only got a 50, 50. Um, <laughs> and that, you know, and he was only spoken of because he wasn't speaking in those gospels. Right. And mm-hmm. I think that that can be very mm-hmm. difficult for us men when we really dive into St. Joseph is how do we know so much about St. Joseph? Well, I want to start by just reading quickly from scripture and Jesus went down with them. That's Jesus, uh, Joseph and Mary mm-hmm. and was subject to them. And his mother kept all these words in her heart. And Jesus advanced in wisdom, age, and grace with God and men. So I want us to pause here and I want to talk briefly about the fact that for 18 years of Christ's life, 30 years total, but for we know right after him being lost in the temple um, and, and that great you know, anxiety and worry that, that Joseph and Our Lady experienced before finding him three days later, that the only thing we know in scripture for those 18 years is that Jesus glorified God more in being subject to Joseph and Mary. If we can't think about that and say, wait, so for three years he evangelized and he theologized and he, um, we have all the great miracles and writings and, and casting out of demons of Christ in only three years of his life, but for 18 years of his life, six times uh, more than his public ministry, he was subject to Joseph and Mary. And that doesn't give you a pause and say, what was he doing for those 18 years? What would mm. subjection mm. to to uh, St. Joseph look like? And, and Sam, you're already bringing it up a little bit and alluding to it. And so before we dive into these five pillars, um, Devin, Sam, any thoughts real quick on on that, um, that scripture yeah. verse there? I would love to comment on that. So I think it was either Origen or Tertullian said that when Jesus went down with them to Nazareth, he said that that going down expresses the humility of the son of God subjecting himself to the authority of Mary and Joseph. And when we look at Joseph and we see the example of his authority, it is a mirror of Jesus's humility. So that right there, and, and I loved also the idea, here it is that Joseph had this grain of wheat and in, in, in he brought Jesus into his storeroom in Nazareth. See, Joseph is like the Old Testament Joseph, 
Okay. Yeah. Joseph, the seven years of plenty, he's bringing the grain into the bins. And then the seven years of famine, all the Middle Eastern world comes to Joseph, go to Joseph, what he says, you do. Well, Jesus, he goes into the grain bin in Nazareth of Joseph's house. And Joseph takes this grain of wheat and builds it up so that it can become the bread of life that feeds the nations. And so it's just very beautiful when you look at that deep subjection and that interplay between Jesus and Joseph and this self-giving, this self-sacrificial love. And Joseph taught Jesus what Jesus lived and Jesus lived what Joseph taught. Mm -hmm. And that subjection to one another out of reverence for Christ, so huge. Yeah. Thanks be to God. Sam. Yeah. And, and again, I guess everything Devin is saying is, is so important, you know, this humility. And also I think there's huge humility, like great humility on St. Joseph's part in the sense that he accepted a role that probably made him very uncomfortable. Yes. You know, knowing that this was the son of God, this was the Messiah, this was the, the, the promised one, you know, that, that generations and generations had waited for and longed for. And here he is entrusted with the fatherhood of this, of this Messiah, of the son of God. And like probably made him feel incredibly inadequate to the task at times, perhaps. I mean, I guess I'm projecting a little bit my own mindset onto that, but like in his humanity, St. Joseph was, was, was probably in, sometimes intimidated by this task and yet he didn't shrink back from it. And I think this shows a great degree of humility on his part in taking on this role. He's married to the perfect woman and he has the perfect son. And he's, he's like, but yet he still embraces this role of father of this beautiful, holy family and doesn't run away from it, doesn't shrink back from mm -hmm. it, doesn't neglect his duties out of fear or, you know, some neurotic anxiety that, I'm not up to the task, so I might as well not even try. Or like some of the, yeah, a lot right. of things that we, the head games we play with ourselves in order to shirk our responsibilities sometimes. He leaned into it and he said, maybe I am in inadequate to this in incredibly huge task, but I'm not running away. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to show up every day. Hmm. And yeah, I'm going to be that wise steward, that, that one hmm. that, prepares the way of salvation, so to speak. Um, you know, I'm going to steward these gifts that I've been entrusted with. It kind of takes me to the parable of the talents, honestly. It was like Joseph was given the most talents of anybody <laughs> ever yeah. in the sense of yeah, this amen. huge wow. responsibility, this huge responsibility. And he didn't squander it. He didn't shrink back out of fear. He showed up every day. And yeah, he was that that beautiful example of manhood and righteousness and all of these things. And obviously Christ in his divinity didn't need any of that. But I think sometimes we get so focused on Christ's divinity that we we neglect his humanity sometimes. And we yeah. know that kind of he, he humbled himself. He emptied himself of those divine prerogatives. That was part of his becoming human. Um, and so Jesus did get tired. He, he didn't learn how to he need to learn how to read and write. He was probably instructed by St. Joseph in the Hebrew scriptures. He was probably taught, you know, to pray throughout the day in the Jewish way, you know, from the, the different prayers of the day that Jews prayed. And all of these things that were part and parcel of a righteous Jewish life, yeah. St. Joseph was teaching to our Lord in, in his humanity. And... You know, obviously they didn't have bikes back then, but I just, I imagine a lot of the things that kids had to learn back then, like you know, like today we have to teach our kids how to ride a bike or whatever. Like St. Joseph was teaching our Lord these things. And it was this beautiful interplay between uh, the greatness of the Son of God, but also this great man that really poured. I think he just gave, he just gave Jesus everything. Like everything that he had learned, all of his wisdom that he had gained over the years, like I just, I can just imagine him like passing that on to Christ, um, and and you know, and when he when it came time for him um, to to die and to you know go to be with with God, he I think he, and again, this is a bit of my imagination, I admit, but 
I think he died with great peace, knowing that he had done his duty well, that he had given Christ mm. every ounce of his life and energy and wisdom and like, and, and, uh, it's just, I think that's what, as men, that's what we can hope for. Then we can, on our deathbed, we can know that we gave our, our families and those who were part of our life, the tapestry of our life that we, we gave our all, we gave it all. And I think to me, like, at least personally, like, that's what, that's how one way I want to be like St. Joseph, knowing that I laid it all on the line, poured my heart out, my whole being into those mm -hmm. that God has entrusted to me. And that I, you know, God says to me, well done, good and faithful servant, like he did to St. Joseph for that reason. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, they they crafted the cross of self sacrificial love in that workshop in Nazareth. They crafted the cross of self sacrificial love. So in in Jesus's humanity, he received the pedagogy of the cross in that workshop through conversation, mm -hmm. sweat, you know, maybe even tears at times, working, serving. There, there was that interplay of self-giving love. They crafted the cross. Joseph prepared him, humanly speaking, to be able to embrace that cross. Yeah, amen. So how did St. Joseph's life help him become the strongest man ever to live, this inner strength that we're talking about here? It was actually pretty hard early on when I was introducing this episode to not say his name. So, um, <laughs> right. Um, but, uh, but wonderful. So the first thing that we want to talk about is uh, St. Joseph and silence. And we really want to spend some time talking about the importance of silence, because I actually think that this is one of the hardest thing for men today, right? We are constantly, constantly bombarded with, with uh, noise. If you're a father with a lot of young children or any children, right? There's those concerns. They're around. Uh, if you're uh, living in the world, if you're working on a computer, if you're, you know, driving to and from work with the radio and now podcast and, you know, everything at your disposal nonstop, right? The amount of of temptations to drown out the noise to you know to uh, sorry to yeah just um drown out, uh, the drown out your thoughts your silence with noise yeah is is just everywhere at every turn constantly in ways that it never was before. And so as such, we've never lived like this. I can think of my own growth, you know, growing up and, um, you know, there was, there was some silence in my, my household, but not a lot. And there was definitely the TV and there was definitely school. And then when school came a part of my life, it was just, you know, talking to friends and hanging out with friends and going outside and just, just filling every day, every moment of every day with stuff, with things to do, uh, things to listen to, things to watch. Etc. And so the idea of setting back and and turning to this great treasure, as Saint uh, John of the Cross states, God's first language is silence. Right? right? I didn't I didn't know that. I I didn't I couldn't hear uh, hear him and understand the importance of this this mm -hmm. pillar of this you know defining character trait uh, that um, that Saint Joseph obviously so recognizes. But before we talk about that, I want to just add that men to and tell you dive in and embrace the silence, you're not going to be able to hear God's voice. You're not going to be able to understand his will for your lives. You're not going to be able to build that relationship of love. And this is something that I think here at the Catholic Gentleman we're so big on is this idea that, this understanding that God is love. He is a loving father. We are called to cultivate to build a relationship with a loving father, with Christ our Savior, with our Blessed Mother, not just a list of commandments, not just a list of, in fact, the, the reading today, um, it d discusses the, uh, that fact that Christ came to fulfill the commandments, but not to abolish them, right? But still very often, we fall into this pharisaical mindset where it's just this list of to-do lists and stuff like that, and we miss the point of building that relationship. We miss the point of fasting and consistent and dedicated fasting to do one thing, to be able to communicate with God more uh, directly and understand his will and his guidance in our lives more fully so that we can build that relationship. One of the pillars here at the Catholic gentleman. And so I just wanted to really start with silence as that first uh 
pillar of St. Joseph and, and get your men's thoughts on it as well. And so, Devin, why don't you take it away and talk a little bit about the importance of silence as a virtue and silence as a lived experience day in and day out? Yes. So this is one of our four pillars as a father of St. Joseph is to embrace the silence. And and I believe that this is the foundation for nearly everything. I It's interesting, you know, to think that we could have a church of men full of power. And what I mean by that is God's power being manifest through them. And it's like, but they're not tapping into the power source. It's like I had a backup drive one time that was not plugged in and I was wondering why it wasn't backed up and I called the technician, ran me through all these resolutions. Well, it wasn't, it was because the power cord wasn't plugged in, you know, and, and yeah. that's the way we are. If we're not plugged in to the power source by the power cord of prayer, we're pretty much useless, no matter how perfect and talented and beautiful we are or whatever. So this silence thing, you look at St. Joseph. I love St. Joseph's example of silence. It, it actually just inspires me so much because never is a word of his recorded in the scriptures. We don't know anything he said, but we do know how he prayed because, and mm. we do know how he handled difficult situations. St. Joseph had one of the most difficult situations ever. We, and we just gloss over it because we've heard it a million times, but he was betrothed to Mary, the first stage of Jewish marriage, the Kedushish, you know? And so th before the solemnization, there was about a year waiting period. He was officially married to Mary, okay? The first stage of Jewish marriage. So it was legal. And yet there was this waiting period. And it was during that period that he discovered Mary pregnant without his cooperation. That's a big deal. I mean, that's yeah. a huge deal. And St. Thomas Aquinas tells us that Joseph didn't a suspector of adultery. St. Thomas Aquinas tells us this, St. Bernard, all of them. But St. Joseph was like Sam said, it's this, who am I that the ark of the Lord, that the mother of the Lord should come to me, you know? So it's like, it's like Uza, wasn't it Uza who, who touched the ark and God smote mm -hmm. him on the spot. Yes. And David says, who am I that the ark of the Lord should come to me? the ark of the Lord contained the, the manna from heaven, you know, Aaron's rod, all of that. And here it is. You've got the ark of the Lord, Mary, who contains Jesus, the, the, the priesthood, the manna from heaven. And he's like, I'm not worthy, but what happens? I love this. This is where we learn about Joseph's interior life. Joseph, it says that he pondered on these things. And, and it's not like he just sat back and, you know, punched in something on Google search. What do you do when you have a pregnant wife? That's not your child. You know I mean? Like, what do you do? No, right. <laughs> Joseph, that, that, that Greek word, we've talked about this before for ponder is entomeome, which the root, root word is thumos and, but it's thumos grieving, thumos, the masculine warrior spirit grieving. So we know that Joseph was agitated. He was in tension. He was hurting because he knew the beauty, the glory, the, the holiness of Mary and could not suspect her of adultery, but there's no way he could explain the situation. Perhaps there's a hunch that this really could be the Messiah, but he wasn't sure and he couldn't prove it. He couldn't prove her innocence, nor would he allow anybody to condemn her. And so what does he do? I love this. He doesn't put it out on Facebook. He doesn't tweet it. What he does is he goes to God in silence. And that's the first step. He goes to God in silence yeah. and he waits and wow. he waits and he waits. He presents that grieving, agitated heart, that masculine grieving spirit to God without even words. He can't even express what he's going through. And, but this is a key. He trusts. And I love what happens here. It is in this time of prayer because of Joseph's trust in being a man enough to enter the silence and not trying to resolve the problem himself, take control. Cause that's what we do all the time. We go to control mode. I got to solve this myself. I got to figure out how much money I need to clear this up or whatever. Joseph trusts in the Lord so much. And we don't know how long he waited two minutes, two hours, two days, two weeks, two months. We don't know, but he kept showing up for prayer. And this is what's beautiful in that time. God sends the message of his identity and his mission. Joseph, son of David, that means you're a king. You're an underground hidden king. Do not fear to take Mary, your wife. She's your wife. Don't be afraid to take this mission. So you are a son of a king. You are a son of mine. Therefore, now go act like it and fulfill your mission to embrace the greatest woman of the world and take her under your mantle, protect her, but then also take the child that she has as your own. 
boom. Identity and mission revealed in silence. And I think for every guy, we need to hear this, is if you want to know your identity truly, if you want to know your mission truly, if you want God to work through your life truly, you've got to be determined to enter the silence daily because God says, I'm not impressed with holocausts and sacrifices, but an open ear, an open ear. That's right. Excellent. And this is hard for this is hard for men because uh, I think there's this element of we don't want to face things that we can't control. Um and that's not just externally, okay? If you ever sit in silence for any length of time, things are going to come to the surface in your own yes. heart. They're going to scare you. Things that emotions, things that memories, experiences, Thoughts racing, like you're going to come face to face with your own interior life, yeah. as messy as that can be sometimes, as chaotic as that can be sometimes. And that's really uncomfortable. And we don't want to open the lid, you know, like we don't want to lift the lid on that look inside. We don't we don't want to feel all of those things. So we just keep things all surface level. But we're missing out on both, you know, like St. Augustine said so well, like man is a great depth, oh Lord. You know, like who... Who can even know what's in the human heart? And we go and like look at all these mountains and beautiful scenery, the ocean, the coastline, the stars. We're like, wow. But we never look inside. Uh, we, it's like he, St. Augustine says, we pass by ourselves and we don't wonder. You know, but like if you actually <laughs> right. get to know yourself, there's great depths there. There can actually be, and, and until you get comfortable with that, you're not actually going to be open to anything from above either. And so there's a sense in which we're scared of what comes from below, right? Like all of those thoughts and feelings that lie within our own Mm -hmm. hearts. We're also scared of what comes from above. Like what might God ask me to do that I don't want to do, that I'm scared of, that is something out of my control, like Jonah, right? Like God's asking me to do something I really don't want to do, and I'm scared of that. So I'm just going to tune it out. I'm going to tune out any messages from above. I'm going to tune out any knowledge of myself because that could be uncomfortable. That could be scary too. And I'm just going to keep everything surface level. Just chatter away, listen to media, stimulate myself in different ways, distract, distract, distract. Uh, I think it was T.S. Eliot that said like, we're distracted from distraction by distraction. Like, like that's just kind of the <laughs> exactly. modern mindset where it's like, yeah, yeah, we just can't be present. That's great. We just, we're just scared to death of being present. Mm. But face that fear. Like, face the fear of what's in your own heart. Face the fear of of those those messages from above, so to speak. That Saint Joseph didn't run from either of those. He knew how to be silent. Yeah, and and face the discomfort of the silence. And, and be fully present to it, and like that's 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 a call for each of us. Like it's it takes courage to know yourself. It takes courage to listen to God. Yeah. But it's absolutely necessary. I mean, the other option is you can just be completely useless for the kingdom of God. Sure, go distract <laughs> yourself um, wow. without end. Uh, but yeah. but you're going to be useless. You're going to yeah. be completely neutralized. Yeah. Yeah. For the kingdom of God. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And I just, I, I like how you started to pivot it briefly to St. Joseph and how he embodied this. And I think it both you started to do that and Devin, you talked about having an open ear. And I think that this is, this is the point of silence, right? Is to listen. Right. And so if the, if we're just sitting in silence and like Sam said, and this is very, very tempting and we've all fallen into this. Right. And I'll go back to the hermit that I interviewed in Catholic gentleman plus who said, pray as you can, not as you can't. Right. So, but pray, right. That's, that's important. And, um, and he said, pray as you can, not as you can't. And so we have this, this desire to pray a certain way. I voice the question of, I've been looking at the the seven um, 
uh, St. Teresa of Avila's uh, seven star stories or seven, you know, steps to, uh, to the prayer life. And I'm like, and I'm stuck on number two and number three, and I'm never going to get above it. And it's been years. And he said that, yeah, we often project this idea of how we should pray. But just going back to what Sam was saying here is that you're going to, a lot of stuff is going to be dug up, right? A lot of uncomfortable things. And so we can often just get into a intercessory or um, put, uh, prayers of petition, only in the morning. And and I get that. That's this idea where you've got your litany, you're going through it and you're just, you know, actively praying off everything. And, and that's good. But we need to, like St. Joseph, listen, wait, as Devin was saying, St. Joseph uh, had our uh, angel of the Lord came to him four times in dreams, but it was because our, our lady was pregnant and then it was because he needed to go to Egypt to protect his son and his wife. It was because he needed to return, but then where he needed to return uh, there in Nazareth were, were all things that he had to uh, ponder. And if you can't quite imagine the depth of this, uh, this is something that, that it wasn't easy for him either. But at the same time, he committed to it because he understood mm -hmm. there wasn't a more important way of living. Yeah, Devin. Yeah, that's a, it's a great point. St. Joseph didn't do God's will because he could hear angels' voices. He heard angels' voices because he prayed and did God's will. He, mm -hmm. he was so silent, he was capable of hearing the angels' voices. I'm so glad yeah, you stated that. because There's something I want to emphasize about this. As men, we can often get stuck in our logical mind, our analytical mind, where we want to understand and we want to splice and dice and we want to treat everything um, as a formula. And that's that and I'm not, I'm not knocking that like God made us that way. And that's actually a big part yeah. of being masculine is kind of that ability to analyze and rational, be rational. And, and but dreams aren't rational. <laughs> like there's a sense <laughs> right. in which these dreams right. bypass the logical mind. Mm. Um, and yet St. Joseph wasn't stuck here. He also had this heart level awareness that God can speak in many ways. And I'm listening for all of them. Even if it doesn't make mm. sense to my rational mind, like he could have woken up mm. and said, man, that was a weird dream. That didn't make any <laughs> sense. You know, my, my, it's breaking my logical brain. I'm just going to dismiss that. I was probably like, you know, yeah. bad indigestion or something, you know, and like, and, uh, but no, like he was tuned in even to those, uh, supra rational communications from God in the mm -hmm. sense that he comes from this long line of divine dreamers, like going all the way back to like yeah. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, like they all got these dreams from God. Even Saint Joseph in Egypt, right? What was he? He was an interpreter of dreams. And it's very interesting. But it's it's not how it's very uncomfortable for us men to enter this intuitive space where our logical mind can't make sense of anything anymore. But I think what what this goes back to this concept that Devin was talking about of trust. Like he was open to things that didn't make sense to his rational brain, but that he knew were from were divine communications. And he was willing to act on those things. Even though his rational brain would have been, might have been like, what are you doing? You're in the middle of the night taking your family to Egypt with no preparations. You haven't even booked a hotel on Expedia yet. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, and, and he just did it. He just did it because he was so attuned wow. to the divine. He was so attuned yeah. to God's voice, so attuned to God's will that there was like almost no space between God's will and his will anymore. Like he mm -hmm. had, and I, I truly believe it was years of fidelity, years of faithful showing up in prayer and showing up and doing God's will and little things over and over and over again throughout his earthly life that prepared him to say yes to these very subtle, very intuitive things that maybe didn't make sense logically. That maybe didn't yeah. say, make sense rationally, but he knew he was listening. And then I think it was that silence that had prepared the space for God to speak in those ways to him. And whereas we like, the reason God doesn't speak to us in dreams is we're not listening. We're not tuned in. We don't care. Um, and we don't think God actually cares about us and our lives. Um, he's... He, He's out here. He's, he's, he's got the big cosmic picture in mind. He doesn't care about the decisions I have to make. 
He's not intimately involved in my life. But if you can enter that silence, it prepares that space that God can enter into and speak through. Um, Amen. So. Yeah, and I appreciate you saying that. And I actually just read a quote today, and then I'm going to bring up uh, regarding this. He didn't lose his identity. He gained his identity. And in gaining his identity, he hunted after that uniformity with God's will, that docility uh, to the spirit. He hunted after that. And in silence, he was able to hear it. And I liked how you stated that there was there was like no separation between his will and God's will. And I, St. John Vianney, uh, in a quote that I read today, said, I wish I could lose myself and never find myself except in God. And St. Joseph was able to do that. He was able to do that because, and I loved what you stated earlier, Devin, and I already uh, mentioned it, is, is that uh, he didn't just, um, what was it? He didn't um, hear, he wasn't uh, doing God's oh. will because of dreams. Yeah, yeah it was, was because he was doing of, God's will. Yeah, he was capable of doing God's will because he had basically attended silence. He's capable of hearing the angels' voices because he's a man of silence. So it's so important. It's so yeah. I think, you know, imagine you're building a skyscraper and if you don't dig, if you don't through the bedrock and drill down hundreds and hundreds of feet, like some of these skyscrapers demand for a foundation and like loads and loads of metal and pillars and all that stuff that's supporting it. If you don't do that, that skyscraper is going to blow over. You know, and that's what we're doing in prayer. We want to be a skyscraper that reaches the heavens and, and, and let your light shine before men. There's nothing wrong with this. The two petitions in the Our Father are, you know, hallowed be thy name, the glory of God, thy kingdom come and glorify me. That's what St. Thomas Aquinas says. Those are the two petitions right there. And so there's nothing wrong with being a skyscraper for God, as long as it's not about you. But you got to dig deep. You got to build that foundation. No foundation, no skyscraper. It just falls. Same thing with trees. Low, shallow root system, the tree's going to topple in a storm. It's not going to grow to its maturation height, you know? So we've got to go deep. And like Sam, you were saying, when we go deep as a tree, we dig in the dirt. We get dirty. Yeah. We get dirty with our memories, with our sins, with ourself. And it's so beautiful in there is because that we can allow that to rise as surface. And then we can have conversation with God about that. And then God can shed his light into it and say, hey, this is because of woundedness. Yes, this was a bad decision. But however, now I'm going to make good out of it. Trust me, you know. But I think there's yeah. something else. With St. Joseph, what is so beautiful is what, why is he the master of the interior life, as he's called? I think yes. Joseph's the master of the interior life because he studied something that so few people really study, and that's Jesus. And it's Jesus with Mary, living pictures, motion pictures of the rosary, if you will. He studied them day and night. He learned from them in silence and he spilled this around in his mind and his heart and he embodied all of this. And so St. Joseph is a treasury of grace for us. If we just go to him, he's going to reveal so much about our Lord. If we just go to Joseph and do what he tells us to do. So I think Joseph holds the key for the interior life. Meditate on Jesus. Meditate on Mary. In that, you will discover so much just by doing that. And then you get involved. You, you see yourself in the mirror of those meditations and, okay, I'm not adding up here. Lord, help me here or help me to be this like them or help me to be that or cultivating the relationship with them. St. Joseph, please help me. Mary, please help me, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I just think that the man who is devoted to silence is the man who comes forth a, a, an understanding of, of the, the will of the Father the trust, trusting in the will of the Father to direct his life. So a man who is devoted to silence is seen, seen St. Joseph as, as a model for this and trying to live up to that model and to that example because in doing so, that trust and that um, fullness of life will, will be granted mm. onto him. Mm. And yes. I just— I, in, I love in, that. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. No, please. Well, I was just going to say on that point, yes. How do we know if someone has a great interior life? Their interior life gives their exterior life form. How do we know that St. Joseph was had a masterful interior life? It was because he was a living reflection of God the Father to Jesus. He was a living reflection, really, uh, 
beforehand of Christ to Mary in their marriage. This is how we know Joseph had such a substantial interior life because his interior life gave his exterior life form. That's, I mean, that's what I'm getting from what you're saying. Exactly. And I, and I just think, and then from, for, I, we're, I love this conversation. I love, and I don't mean to, to move us to the next one, but I do think it's from this interior life that blossoms obedience. And I think that this is the next thing that we really wanted to talk about uh, today was this, uh, the obedience and how it was reflected in St. Joseph. Because uh, when we see obedience, it's very often that it's something negative, you know, it's something that is forced upon us that, that we just, we have to do it maybe reluctantly. We, um, you know, instead of something that like St. Joseph shows us is kind of filled with joy and purpose. And mm-hmm. it's this interior life that had grown again in that silence. He had listened so well that he knew in, in, in his love of a trusting father that, he had to do these things. And so we see in St. Joseph, his obedience, and as it comes to things we've already talked about, but taking our blessed mother in, going to Egypt, flying to a country that, like he said, he hadn't booked Expedia. He didn't check his bank account to make sure he could afford it. <laughs> he, right. he, he was dependent on gold that was brought from the, the Magi. And, <laughs> right, um, right and on. So, and so he just had this trust, but he had this obedience that, that was unwavering. And I think I want to talk about that virtue of obedience because when this was taught to me years ago that there will be no disobedience in heaven and therefore we must practice obedience here in this world. Again, you know, <laughs> You know, it, it hit me, it struck me. And it's like, yeah, that's such a good point, right? That, but how can we practice obedience here by doing the will of God, by understanding his direction and his guidance in our lives and from going forth? So anyway, Sam, when we talk about obedience, I'd love to hear your thoughts there on its, on, on its just essence in the life of man. Yeah, uh, uh, the word obedience it c- it comes from the, the Latin root for like audere or like abadere, like oh, to to listen. So it, obviously that is very, very closely related to the first. We have to be listening before we can mm. obey. But second, like, yeah, there's this sense in which people think obedience is slavery. Mm. Well, someone's telling me what to do. And I hate to be told what to do. Uh, but I guess I'm going to screw up my courage and do it anyway because I guess we're just called to obedience as Catholics. I think what we're talking about, though, is, again, like, if you think of God's will and your will, like, some for a lot of us, there's this big chasm where it's like, what I want to do is contrary to what God wants. But I think if you look at the life of St. Joseph, obedience was not something that came from the outside and was imposed on him. He wanted... God's will. So there was no sense in which God's will was contrary to what he wanted. And he had to find some way to press through that. I think there was this union of his will and God's will that was so intimate that everything Saint God wanted St. Joseph could say, yeah, that's what I want too. Now, for a lot of us, though, the way we experience obedience, because we're not as holy as St. Joseph quite yet, is we kind of experience as God's will is here and our will is here. There's a cross there. There's resistance to God's will in our lives. And so sometimes we do know what we need to do. We resist doing it, and yet we do it anyway. And there's still virtue and great merit in that. I want to I wanna emphasize mm-hmm. that like while it might be a lesser form of obedience in the sense that the ultimate form might be wanting exactly what God wants at every moment, so that you can say, I want what I want and what God wants, there's no distance between those. But for, for a lot of us, there is distance, and we have to press on anyway. We have to um, maybe answer that call of obedience that we're hearing because we're listening, and we're docile to God's will, and we make a sacrifice of our own will. We empty ourselves of our own will. We lay down our own will in order to answer that call that's coming from above, so to speak. And that, that can be a challenge. That can be a sacrifice. Sure. But it's actually sure the is. essence of holiness. You know, St. So Maximilian Colby says, like, the essence of holiness is my will plus God's will equals holiness. Mm. Like, that's, that's it. It's mm-hmm. that simple. But simple doesn't always mean easy. Like, there still has to be, mm. there's going to be many moments in your life when you're maybe called to surrender your will 
in order to obey God's will. Um, and sometimes that's as simple as like going to mass when, you know, the big game is airing or something like that, where it's like, oh man, I really would like this. But the church um, and God through the church is asking me to do this. And I'm going to sacrifice and empty myself of my will in order to do God's will. Um, so uh, that much more can be said about obedience, but I think that the foundation is listening and then doing, even if there's resistance in, in our, at our will level, we're still making an act of the will to move forward and obey. Amen. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Pope John Paul II, he said in Guardian of the Redeemer, uh, he, he said that Joseph rose and did what the angel of the Lord commanded him. And then John Paul II says, this doing is the beginning of Joseph's way. And that's, that's the heart of obedience is like when we're obedient to God, it opens up a, a, a way for us. That was Joseph's way of life. His way to greatness is his Paul the six. I believe he said that in St. Joseph, we discover the secret of a life of great, a secret to the life of greatness. And so obedience is the proof of love. Padre Pio, I believe, said that. Obedience is the proof of love, but it's an obedience from the heart and not just from the head. And I would kind of push back just a little bit, although I love everything you said, Sam, but I would just push back a little bit with Jesus in the garden. It wasn't like, oh, go get him, tiger. You know, I'm so happy to go to the cross, Father. You know, I mean, it was, but it was more like, not my will, but thy will be done. Please let this cup pass from me, yet I am willing to do whatever you want. And in that, that's where I can relate to our Lord and St. Joseph very much, because I feel like there's so many times where I want to do God's will so bad, but it feels so painful and so wrong initially. And yet when I have that Passover experience, I gut it out because I love the Lord I find that on the other side, oh my gosh, you opened up a whole new way for me, Lord, that I never could have expected. And I think that's what happened with Joseph with Mary. I think that when he discovered Mary pregnant without his cooperation, there was this moment where, and in fact, the scripture indicates this, that he wished to put her away privately. So this isn't the action of like, oh, yay, this is a great thing. You know, I mean, he was like, I got a protector from, you know, the Jews, from the, the authorities. Um, but this isn't a happy time for me, but Lord, I'm going to submit to your will in all of this and wait on you. And then by obeying a whole way is opened up for St. Joseph, a way he could never expect it. And I also think that just pondering on this a little bit, and this is for all of us, Joseph brought two turtle doves, you know, for the sacrificial uh, offering for Jesus's birth in accordance to keeping the, uh, the, the, the mandates of the law. He had Jesus circumcised on the eighth day, and he may have even circumcised him himself. He literally brought Jesus into the Old Testament and fulfilled in the Old Covenant what Jesus could not fulfill for himself, for Jesus. He, he fulfilled the 40-day prescription for Mary, you know, and yes, they went and they offered the two turtle doves. When Jesus was 12 years old, they brought him to the temple, bar mitzvah, to bring him in as adult. Joseph and Mary went up to feast in Jerusalem every year for the feast of the Passover. What do we see in Joseph? Joseph was liturgically obedient. And it was from this liturgical obedience, another life of obedience opens up for him in the practical daily living of life. That creates this, by that, by that liturgical obedience, then God says, good good. I can trust you. And I'm going to trust you with so much. And he keeps trusting Joseph with so much that his life literally becomes this epic adventure. That's what I love. I love that there's this tension like, okay, I know this is your will. This does not feel good. I'm going to do it because I love you. And then boom, I'm on an adventure and this is amazing. And and Lord, you're doing this. I, I can't believe it, but it was painful, but yet I was obedient. That's what obedience can give to us. It begins with liturgical obedience and then God will entrust us more in our natural day-to-day practical life, and he'll open up new horizons for us. And our life will become one of an epic adventure that God has taken us on, one that we could never, a story we couldn't have written for ourselves. Yeah. 
Yeah. So what I'm hearing from both of you is something that obedience requires action. And it's something that I didn't really reflect on until I'm hearing you guys talk, but obedience maybe even brings forth action, right? So we understand in the interior life, the will of God. And in doing so, even if it's difficult, even if it's hard and don't get me wrong, I have failed many times because it's difficult and I've decided to choose my way over his, that when we push past, when we move forward, when we take action, that's when the the true life can 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 really manifest itself in our yeah. in in our lives and those yeah exactly and it's that it's that parable that Jesus told between like the the two sons right one that uh go go do go do this the father says and one son says yeah absolutely I'll do it and then he doesn't do anything. The other yeah. son says, no, <laughs> right. I'm not going to do it. Exactly. But then he actually does it. Um, and again, yeah, you're exactly right, John. It's like, it's like that action, like desire, like words, des- desires, intentions, they don't, they don't really count in the scheme of things. It's like action mm. consummates the desire, you know? And it's like, if you just sit there dreaming about it, you know, like it doesn't do your soul a lot of good. But if you do yeah. it, uh, like that's what counts. Uh, I, I think that's such an important point. Yeah, Amen. God, God is the eternal act. You know, Saint Thomas qu- calls him, and and we're called to be like God in that we're men of action, and and so we have a potential in us toward that action, but that potential is never realized unless we act toward that action, and that's when we become like God. Yeah. And so I am going to take a moment here and apologize to our listeners because I was hoping to get through three in the public edition, but we are already at an hour. And so we will not be getting through three, but we will be inside of Catholic Gentleman Plus. We're going to go into authority. We're going to go into sacrificial love and we're going to go into his humility. But what I like most important is how his greatness as a man in the lineage of King David, who himself understood that he was a king and had a right to king ship found greatness in humility we're going to talk about that inside of catholic gentleman plus so head over there if you're interested in hearing more likely another whole lengthy episode i also (laughs) want to come back in an episode in the future to talk about how do we understand and hear god's voice and how do we hear the will of god because i know that's a question that frequently comes up and we're always looking for these black and white answers uh to things so hopefully we'll be able to dialogue about that in a future episode so before we jump over and say a goodbye i want to put on the new man right every single week we put on the new man where we give a challenge to our listeners to take action so that they can actually be the man that they're trying to be and that they're striving to be. And we give you little tidbits and ways to help. So this week I'm putting on the new man. We want you to consecrate yourself to St. Joseph using a prayer of consecration that you can find in the show notes. So if you click on that prayer, it's going to take you over to a prayer of consecration to St. Joseph. March 19th is Tuesday. So if you're hearing this before March 19th, put an alarm notice on your phone, write it down on your calendar. You are going to pray this consecration prayer on the feast of St. Joseph. If you're hearing this after March 19th, I'm sorry, it's too late. No, I'm joking. You should <laughs> grab <laughs> grab that prayer and pray it, right? It's it's one of those things that there's never um, there's never a wrong time to, to consecrate yourself to St. Joseph or Our Lady. There are just some times that are more fitting in the church calendar and in the year and, and you know, maybe more filled with uh, a certain degree of zeal and 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 i encourage you to to do that whenever so thank you so much men for this conversation it is always edifying and i'm just grateful to hear all the wisdom that you guys are able to share with me and our listeners so as we end each of our episodes be a man be a saint